let's get started. So tonight's topic is um, regarding canine lymphoma. I haven't really spoken much about the cats. Um, but I think, you know, lymphoma is definitely a, a disease that we see with, with relatively free, relative frequency. Um, I don't think the disease as such has changed much in the past 30, 40 years, but the diagnostic tests that we have available now has certainly enlightened us to realise that lymphoma is not just lymphoma anymore. There is, there is a lot more to it. There are definitely lots of different subtypes. Um, and, and some of these newer diagnostic tests we, we hear about, well, but perhaps we're not really sure whether they need to be used every time or just in certain cases. Um, and what is the importance of, of these tests? You know, does it really give us any information to change what our treatment approach is going to be? So we'll just run some, through some of these things. It's not a very visual talk. We, we nearly almost had no visual things to look at. Um, but, but bear with us. Happy to take questions as we go. Um, you know, very casual. Uh, just a few things that we'll run through is just some very basic definitions. Come on in. Did you want to drink before you start? No. <laughs> um, there's some food there, but otherwise grab a seat. And, and then we'll look at how we can classify lymphoma. Again, there, some of these things that, that you probably learnt at uni, um, but there are some newer things that have come through now as well. What are the diagnostic tests we have, have available and what could be a fairly you know, routine approach to staging a, a, a dog with lymphoma. Briefly a little bit about prognostic factors and then some of the um, new and exciting treatments that, that are not here yet, but maybe in the future. So just to start, and I don't really want to insult your intelligence, but I'm really going back to basics, and I'll just gloss over this fairly quickly. Um, it's not something that you need to memorise or, or know in detail, but it just will start to highlight why lymphoma is such a complex disease. So if we look at um, the actual cell that lymphoma grows from, it's a lymphocyte, which, um, as you all know, is a white blood cell that's involved in the immune system. And broadly speaking, there are B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, and natural killer lymphocytes, which we often forget about. The B lymphocytes are involved in the humoral immunity of the adaptive immune system, their, their main function is to produce antibodies, um, but they've got a few other functions as well. The main feature that differentiates B lymphocytes from any of the other lymphocytes is that they have this thing called a B cell receptor, um, and that's your traditional antibody um, schematic where you have um, a heavy chain and a light chain, and at the top end you have a variable region and then a, a constant region at the end. And that will become important as we go along. Within B lymphocytes, there are also subsets that we know about. Um, you know, plasma cells, there are memory cells, follicular cells, marginal zone cells, and um, more recently they've discovered, discovered these regulatory B cells. And what I'm trying to highlight here is that when you start to realise that that there is you know, more than one lymphocyte, it's not surprising that there is more than one lymphoma. So similarly, um, T lymphocytes have a role in cell-mediated cell mediated immunity, so they don't produce antibodies, um, but they destroy antigens when the antigens are attached to, attached to antigen-presenting cells. They also have a role in preventing autoimmune disease um, by producing the, the regulatory T cells, which dampen that response. And again, to differentiate, to differentiate them from other lymphocytes, they have this thing called a T cell receptor, which again has a variable and constant region. And it's that variable region that um, makes these cells specific to different antigens. Uh, again, the T cells have um, lots of different subtypes, and with some of the newer diagnostics we have available, um, we can start to actually pick out those individual cells and then, again, when it gets to lymphoma, we can actually pick out what is the, the cancerous cell. 
So natural killer lymphocytes is, is the one that we all do forget about. Um, that they're not a very common cell, but they're part of the innate immune system, so they don't produce antibodies. Um, they don't have a, um, a T cell receptor or a B cell receptor. They just basically um, are the very rapid-acting defense cells. So just to get on the, the slightly larger scale, um, the anatomy of a lymph node, um, you have an outside um, capsule, if you like, then you have the area where those yellow circles are the, the developing follicles, which is mainly where the B cells reside, and then the blue areas are the, the paracortical areas, which are mainly where the T cells reside, and then you, you go along and you have macrophages and plasma cells. And the importance of, I guess, that sort of concept is um, when we think about diagnosing lymphoma and we start to hear some of these weird and wonderful names like um, uh, marginal zone lymphoma or follicular lymphoma, it's because the pathologist is, is looking at the, um, the pattern of, of how those cancer cells are, are developing. And, and so this is just one little um, follicular area, and, and you can see that depending on where the original cancer cell arose from, that is why we have slightly different forms of lymphoma that develop. And the, the one in red there is diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is the most common subtype that we diagnose. So it brings us on to lymphoma. Um, you may also have heard it called lymphosarcoma or malignant lymphoma, and basically it's a malignant transformation of lymphocytes. The, um, all those terms are correct. We generally just use lymphoma. Um, normally the, the oma as opposed to sarcoma represents a benign form of the disease, but there is no benign form of lymphoma. Um, even when you have localised disease, if that localised disease is not treated, it has the ability to um, turn into high-grade disease and, and disseminate in the future. So it's, it's always considered malignant. So the classification of lymphoma is really important because it gives us an indication of um, what the prognosis might be for that patient and also um, as we evolve, the, the therapies that we have available will start to be very targeted to the different classifications. And definitely in the human world, that's happening already um, to a degree that, that I don't know that we can even dream about, but the veterinary world is definitely moving in that direction too. So firstly, the anatomic classification. Um, we all know this, and this is one that, you know, I think we probably... Um, appreciate it, but sometimes it's good to actually sit back and think about, okay, we've got a dog with multicentric lymphoma. What does that mean for that dog? And, and I guess conversely, how is that different for the dog from the dog that presents with alimentary lymphoma? We know that the prognosis for those two dogs is very, very different with alimentary lymphoma being usually very, quite a, very aggressive um, and perhaps not as responsive to treatment. Um, Cutaneous lymphoma, not very common, but the treatments are usually quite different rather than a CHOP therapy. Um, we often just look at single-agent lamustine therapy for those. So, so we probably do this innately, but it's sometimes good just to sit down and think about, okay, what form of disease have we got? What does that mean for this patient from a prognostic point of view? And does it change the treatments that we should be offering this patient? The next... A lot of classification is, is something that um, is certainly evolving all the time and, and when you send off your histo um, samples from a, a lymph node that you, you have from a dog with suspected lymphoma, um, you'll get a report back and you know, the final diagnosis is usually some form of lymphoma, <laughs> if it is. Um, but some of those terms we, we may not be familiar with. Um, and essentially, what pathologists are trying to do is work out a scheme of describing the cells and describing um, using immunophenotyping as well to try and give us an indication of, of what type of uh, what subtype of lymphoma that we might be dealing with. And over the years, these are the five um, main human lymphoma classification schemes that have been developed over. 
the last 50 years. The Rappaport scheme was first developed in 1966. And all of those, to a degree, have been applied to canine lymphoma, but none of them have really um, been successful in giving us any information on you know, what that means clinically. Um, in humans, you may be aware that lymphoma can often be Hodgkin's lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, in dogs, essentially, what we know as lymphoma is more similar to the non-Hodgkin's disease. But even when we try and compare those two subsets, in dogs, particularly with nodal lymphoma, more of the um, patients we see have high-grade disease, whereas humans have about 50-50 low-grade, high-grade. And so even though the pathologist may say that, that the cells from this dog look like the cells from this human, and so perhaps it's the same disease, it doesn't necessarily mean that clinically that's going to um, be correct. So essentially, um, the, the most recent one is, is real scheme, um, the revised European-American classification of lymphoid neoplasms, which was actually um, proposed in 1999 or quite a while ago in the human world, and it has been adopted by the World Health Organization um, because it, is, it appears to be quite useful for the human side. Um, in 2011, some um, veterinary pathologists published that they applied that scheme to canine lymphoma, and essentially they got 30, uh, 300 um, canine lymphoma um, histopath samples, they had 20 pathologists um, review those samples and they were sort of trained, if you like, in what each of those classifications were and whether then any pathologist who really wasn't um, familiar with the scheme, could they recognise what those cells were and apply it. And actually they came up with a, a pretty good accuracy of 83%. And when a similar thing was done in the, the human world, you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, they had an accuracy of 85%. So, so I think the vets did pretty well. Um, and then if they actually limited it to the six most common diagnoses, diagnoses um, the accuracy just increased a little bit. The more concerning thing was when they actually plucked out 15 of the samples and just hid them back in there again, um, so the, the pathologists were blinded to whether, which ones they were rereading. Um, the agreement between the first and second reading varied between 40 to 87%. Um, so essentially, you know, a pathologist might have looked at it one day and called it something, and then the next day called it something else. And I think, um, I think what that highlights is that you know, pathologists are, are, are literally telling us what they see on that day at that moment in time. Um, you know, we often get our reports and go, well, that's what the disease is, so, you know. Um, but it's our role to, to make sure that that information really fits with what we're seeing in the clinic. And that applies to every, every cancer or every um, disease, basically. And so, again... Um, the reason to have lots of words on the slide is just to show that it's quite complex. Um, there are 43 different lymphoma subtypes that have been um, described in that human scheme. Um, whether there are actually 43 different canine lymphoid neoplasms is yet to be determined. So what sort of information is that histopathologic classification going to give us? What we need to know is that when we read that description, we go, okay, we know that those ones, when treated with this chemotherapy, have this response rate and this survival time. And we don't know that yet, because this scheme's only really starting to be applied over the last few years. Um, any of the, the previous um, papers that have been published about treatments um, you know, haven't used that scheme. But if in the future everyone is adopting the same scheme, then that information will evolve over time. But we do know that grade, uh, architecture of the lymph node mainly, and immunophenotype are useful in that regard, and that is something that we can determine from our biopsy samples that we set, um, submit to the pathologist. So if we look at grade, 
Essentially, um, there are three grades, low, intermediate, and high grade, but in dogs, intermediate grade lymphoma typically behaves as a high grade disease. So for all intents and purposes, there is low grade lymphoma and high grade lymphoma. High grade disease, not surprisingly, it's usually an acute onset. It's that dog that, um, you know, literally a week ago, he was perfectly normal and then bang, you know, um, tennis ball lymph nodes under the chin. They're often of a higher stage of disease and we'll come on to staging a little bit later on. And um, within the tissues, they're often more diffuse. So again, if you pull out a lymph node and have a look at the, um, you know, under the microscope, there are cancer cells wall to wall as opposed to little follicular pockets. Conversely, low-grade disease is usually more chronic in presentation. Um, occasionally, we'll have a history that the lymph nodes kind of wax and waned. Um, they may be of a lower stage of disease. It might only be a couple of lymph nodes in a region. Um, and again, it might be a more focal disease. The, the bad news about high-grade disease, as you know, is that it comes on quickly and left untreated, it, it progresses quickly. But the good news is that those rapidly dividing cells usually respond really well to cytotoxic chemotherapy, which, which acts on dividing cells. Whereas low-grade disease, because it's a more indolent course, they're not rapidly dividing, we may not get um, a great clinical response to chemotherapy agents. And so they're the situations where we need to look at other treatment options rather than just maximum tolerated dose chemo. So indolent lymphoma is a, a term that's used for low-grade disease and, and it um, basically behaves as it sounds. It, it is an indolent course. It, it often just smolders along for a length of time, but essentially all of them have the ability to transform into high-grade disease at some point in time. And these are some names that, that you may recognise from some of your pathology reports. Um, and hopefully, now that you know um, where those names have come from, it kind of makes a bit more sense about where, where these terms have come from. The, the big debate, I guess, at the moment is, um, because we don't know what these descriptions mean clinically, we don't know whether we need to treat them aggressively now or wait till they transform into high-grade disease or should we be using clarambicillin and prednisolone or just monitoring... We, we don't know, essentially. So another way we can classify the lymphomas um, is using immunophenotyping, um, which is trying to determine um, basically whether it's a, a T cell, a B cell, or a natural killer cell. Um, interestingly, if you have a look at the population in a normal lymph node, um, there was just a, a very small study done, but it, it's roughly 50-50 T cells and B cells in there. And so if a pathologist is, is looking at a, a lymph node and they've done immunohistochemistry and they're seeing 90% um, you know, T cells, then, then that's an indication that it's probably a, a T cell lymphoma. Most canine lymphomas are B-cell disease, um, particularly for multicentric disease. When you start to look at cutaneous, um, elementary, some of the other weird and wonderful ones, they're, they're a little bit more frequently T-cell. Um, the natural killer cell or null cell ones are really hard to recognise because um, you know, they, they often don't stain and, and sometimes you're not sure whether it's because there's a, um, an artefact issue um, and then there's some really weird and wonderful ones that are mixed B and T cell, and they are really hard to diagnose. It, it's basically based on the clinical picture. So, so what does it mean? Why, why is it important to know whether it's a T cell or a B cell? I think um, what I was probably taught at uni was that, remember, B is better and T is terrible. But with the information that we're learning, um, particularly about some of these indolent lymphomas, it doesn't always hold true. Um, there are definitely subtypes of B cell disease, um, Burkitt-like lymphoma, that is really aggressive and it doesn't really respond well to chemotherapy. Um, conversely, the, the low-grade T cell diseases can, can smolder on for a really long period of time. So 
So in many cases, yes, that's true, um, but, but just don't take it as verbatim. Um, and then from now, we're getting more information that within the... So we diagnose with a CD3 antibody that we have a T-cell disease. Um, we can now do further immunophenotyping to, to pick out other receptors that might be sitting on those T-cells. Um, and there's been a couple of studies that have shown um, that looking at this CD45, which is a, um, a marker or a receptor that's on most white blood cells, or most lymphocytes, sorry, um, and if they're negative for that receptor, then, then it was associated with a more um, slowly progressive disease and they had quite a long survival time. So that's something that, you know, as we go along, and depending on which labs you use, um, we'll be requesting more and more markers to try and get more information on, on what that means. Similarly, there was um, another study in, in B-cell lymphomas that, that's just highlighting that we can look at other markers now um, and, and as we get more information, that may help dictate um, what our treatments are going to be but also what the prognosis might be. So the, the newer diagnostics, I guess... Um, you know, to diagnose lymphoma, you really just need the clinical picture and an FNA. That's, you know, should be pretty black and white in many cases. Um, and really to start chemotherapy, that's, apart from, you know, perhaps the CBC and biochemistry, that's all you need. If, if I've got a client that's extremely cost-constrained, then spending, you know, several grand on further diagnostics, which is fantastic, um, but then they've got no money left for treatment, then, then that's useless. So, you know, if they come and say, I've got $2,000 to spend, we've got an FNA, we've got bloods, then we'll launch into treatment. That, that's all you need. But um, if we're going to practice the best medicine we can and we have the opportunity, then some of these tests can, can help us and help the owners um, choose the best option for their pet. So isotometry is, um, is fairly new around here, and, and I'll be frank, when I was working in Perth, I had no experience... Um, we didn't have access to it, so, so didn't use it. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to use it yet through Vetnostics. I don't know whether any of you guys um, use them as your external lab, um, but they do have flow now available. Um, what flow cytometry is, is basically you get cells in a, a fluid suspension, and then when they fire them through a fancy machine, um, special lasers can look at the characteristics of the cell, they can look at the cell size, um, they can actually look at how many chromosomes are in there, whether there's a normal number or not, and then also look at some of these um, surface receptors. You can use um, just an FNA sample, you put it into a special fluid medium, um, or it can be done on blood, or um, bone marrow fluid, um, or um, you know, pleural effusion fluid, etc. And the benefit of it, it's a really quick test um, and multiple antibodies can be applied at one time. You might be talking like 10 different antibodies. And that's going to become important um, if we think about, you know, we're not just wanting T or B cell. We want to know if it's a T cell, what are some of those other things that we're trying to determine as well. Um, so, yes, it can tell us whether it's B or T cell. Um, it can confirm more accurately whether this is neoplastic disease versus reactive lymph node disease, and that's what clonality is, that those cells have divided and grown as a, a clone. We can potentially use it in staging. So, um, again, if we're taking FNAs from the liver or spleen or from the bone marrow samples, then um, it's a much more sensitive test than just cytology. And then something that's looked at lots in humans and it has been looked at a little bit in the veterinary world is looking at this minimum, minimal residual disease. So essentially we've treated the dog with lymphoma, the lymph nodes have gone down, we can do an FNA of their node and it looks clear. Um, but can we do a more sensitive test to try and predict that the cancer is coming back before it actually results in big lymph nodes. And if we can do that and start treatment then, does that mean that the dog will get a better response? Um, and we don't know yet, but it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I did speak to Vetnostics recently about the floaters. Do you guys use Vetnostics down here? A little bit? Okay. Um, they do have a really good panel. Um, so if you've got cases um, that, uh, you know, might be suitable, then Doug Haywood um, is the guy who's sort of running it and, and he was very useful to talk to. So another test is this PCR for antigen receptor rearrangement or, or PAR. And essentially what it's trying to do is to amplify the DNA that is encoding for those little receptors, the B cell receptor or the T cell receptor. And essentially what happens as any lymphocyte develops, there's a unique um, way of them changing those variable regions on the end of their receptors, which makes them really specific for different antigens. And that's why you know, we've, we've got hundreds of these different lymphocytes in our body so that we can fight viruses and bacteria and fungi, etc. And what happens is um, when we have um, a cancer developed from a lymphocyte, then that particular receptor stays the same. So they can actually look at the DNA and if it's all the same amongst those cells, then it shows that it's from a clonal population that represents a, a cancer. Um, so that's just a schematic of the, the B cell and the T cell receptor. Um, there's a couple of ways they can look at it. You've, you've seen those um, plates where they've got the, the dark lines on them. If you've got one thick dark line, it's a clonal population. But they also do them as little single peaks. Um, pretty straightforward. If they're polyclonal, so they've got uh, multiple bands or multiple peaks, then, then it's more likely that we've got a reactive disease, that there are um, several different um, DNAs of the different receptors. Um, the, the sensitivity is about 85%, so you can get some false negatives, um, and that might be if it is a, a natural killer lymph lymphoma that doesn't have a receptor or if the cancer in its development has actually um, you know, got, got rid of the receptor um, or, or just a test error. The, the, I guess the benefit of PAR versus flow cytometry is that you can actually use um, any of your cytology slides. They can just scrape some of the stuff off and, and get samples that way, whereas flow samples you do have to um, get them to the lab pretty quickly. They're, they have to be um, really good intact cells. So what's better? Do we use immunohistochemistry? Do we use flow? Do we use PAR? Um, you know, if we simply want to get the answer of is this T or B cell, then when they used immunohistochemistry as the gold standard and compared um, using flow cytometry versus PAR, then flow cytometry was far better um, at um, determining the, the B versus T cell. Um, but again, if you're in a situation that, um, you know, all you've got available is, is getting these PCR samples, then it, then it might be useful. Um, so, so why would you do PAR rather than your immune histochemistry? Is simply because you could do it on an FNA cytology smear. However, my opinion is at this stage, I still think immunohistochemistry is the gold standard, simply because you have to submit a biopsy sample. And then in doing that, the pathologist can look at the tissue architecture. They can tell if it's diffuse wall-to-wall -wall disease. They have a much better appreciation on whether this is low-grade disease or high-grade disease. Um, so in my general workup, if, it's, if the patient's been referred without a, a lymph node biopsy, then, then I will recommend it to the owners. But as I said, if they're cost constrained, by all means, look at um, immunocytochemistry is, is another option. There is, is really nothing published on, on how sensitive or specific it is. Um, but I think if you've got 90% you know, staining, then I think you have to interpret it in light of your clinical findings. So, you know, as with any diagnostic test you do, just always think about why you're doing it, what information are you trying to achieve, rather than just, you know, having a, a wall-to-wall -wall panel. Come in, sit down. <laughs> um, in the scenario where you have a client that perhaps is a little bit cost-constrained, then, then yeah, we can do all these fancy tests, but if at the end of the day they're going to pick um, 
a treatment that perhaps is single agent oral lamustine, then it doesn't really matter if it's T cell or B cell. You know, it's just if it's going to impact on the decision making for you or for the client, then then that's useful to use that test. But otherwise, it's it's I guess it's just a bit academic. So staging. If um, if you put five oncologists in a room and ask them to um, describe their routine approach to staging a dog with lymphoma, I think you probably get five different answers. So again, this is my opinion. The World Health Organization has set out the five clinical stages, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, stage one being low stage, single lymph nodes. Stage two, more than one lymph node, generally in the same area. Stage three, when we have generalized lymph node involvement. Stage four is when we start to get liver and spleen involvement. Um, and stage five is, is usually when we see bone marrow and or blood involvement. Um, and then importantly, each stage is then subclassified into substage A and substage B. Substage A being those well happy dogs and sub substage B when they're already showing signs of disease. So they might be inappetent, um, have vomiting, diarrhea, um, or any of the hypercalcemia, etc., etc. And interestingly, of all the studies that look at um, mainly treatments for, for dogs with lymphoma, the main prognostic factor that holds out is whether they're substage A or substage B. So if we have a dog that's still well when they start treatment, they do far better than waiting till they're showing signs of disease. So um, basic staging could involve any or all of these things. Um, I think as an absolute minimum, we, we do need to get a complete blood count and a, a serum biochemistry and, and really probably a, a UA as well. Um, things to, to look at on your complete blood count is the, obviously, red cells, white cells, platelets. Um, and again, you know, are any, any, is any of this information useful in helping us determine, um, is it going to change our treatment options? Is it um, going to provide information on the prognosis? So there have been a couple of studies that have shown that dogs with lymphoma, uh, sorry, dogs with anemia, um, do have a slightly poorer prognosis, but in those two studies they classified anemia as a PCV less than, um, I think it was 37% in one and 40% in another, so I don't know that I'd really call a PCV as 40 anemic, but have a look at that. Um, what's their white cell count? You know, if you're already um, neutropenic or um, leukopenic, then it might be a sign that we have bone marrow invasion already, molluxiasis, um, and have we got thrombocytopenia as well, which could be immune-mediated or it could be a um, paraneoplastic syndrome. Serum biochemistry, really important, um, particularly when we start to want to give these dogs heavy-duty chemotherapy. We want to know that they can metabolise it um, and come out the other side. So look at their liver function, look at their kidneys. Um, are they hypercalcemic? Um, I, it's reported to be about 30% in dogs, but I don't know whether I just don't get referred those ones because they're already sick and the owners are, oh, it's no good, but I, I don't see a lot of hypercalcemic lymphoma dogs. Um, low albumin, um, could be liver, it could be GI loss. And globulins, you know, have we got a gammopathy as well? Which again, you know, that would fit with a, um, a plasma cell being the original lymphoma cell. So if, if we um, are starting chemotherapy, you know, if they've got liver involvement and their liver is not functioning to its full capacity, it doesn't mean that I'll say, look, this is no good, we can't treat it. It just means that we need to support the liver, use lower doses until we go into remission, and then try and... Um, get them out the other side. Again, if the, the kidney's not great, perhaps have them on fluids for 24 hours before we give the first dose of chemotherapy, just to, to really try and make them feel as well as possible as, as we can. And the poor old urinalysis, which I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone, we just seem to forget about it, but it is really important. And, um, and even on a day-to-day um, -day monitoring thing, um, you know, looking at the, the urine can be really helpful. 
So the urine-specific gravity, you know, if we're isosinuria, is there renal disease? Um, have we got hypercalcemia causing problems? Um, dogs with lymphoma were reported to have um, a higher rate of proteinuria, um, but it didn't really equate to a poor outcome, but it was just, just noted. Um, and bacteria urea as well. So if you, if you do a sediment exam in house and it looks boring, then there's no need to send it off for culture. Um, but if there's anything that, that is a, perhaps a concern, get it cultured because again, once we start on chemo and they may not be able to fight infections very well, um, we don't want to run into a UTI. So thoracic radiographs are, are a very routine part of staging in many cancers. Um, and there is certainly a study that has shown that there are quite a lot of um, dogs that if you take chest x-rays, um, dogs with lymphoma, if you take chest x-rays, that you will see changes. Um, a third of them may actually have lymphoma within the, the lungs themselves, which I think that's really interesting because, again, clinically I don't think we see a lot of dogs that are... Um, you know, coughing or dyspneic or, or clinical for it. Um, not surprising, a lot of them have big lymph nodes in the chest cavity as well, which doesn't really change anything for us. Um, if we are doing chest radiographs, what sort of pattern are we looking for? Um, it could be anything. Lymphoma, it could be big lumps, it could be just a diffuse pattern. Um, <coughs> Unless the dog is clinical for it, um, and perhaps the owners are looking for a reason not to treat, or that um, if they're clinical for it and we have a really heavy tumour burden and we are going to treat and we might need to support that dog really well, then I, then I don't think um, chest x-rays need to be a routine part of staging. Um, it's not wrong but I don't think it needs to be done in that really well-happy golden retriever that's um, jumping around in the, in the consult room. Abdominal ultrasound. Um, we do know that obviously liver and spleen can um, indicate stage 4 disease. The, um, the question is, if it's a normal-looking liver and spleen, does it mean that there's no lymphoma there? Um, if there are nodules and we don't FNA it, does it definitely mean that that's lymphoma nodules? And if it is lymphoma there, does that change our treatment for those dogs? Does it change the prognosis for those dogs? And essentially, no. Um, if you've done your biochemistry blood test and find that the liver's functioning as well as it can be based on a blood test like that, um, then I don't think it changes anything. We, there is no different treatment that we would suggest, um, and it certainly has not been shown to change prognosis. So, again, perhaps you're you know, a much older dog that you might be wanting to look for concurrent disease. Yes, um, but it doesn't have to be a routine part of every single workup. Bone marrow cytology. So if we perform a bone marrow aspirate and send it off a cytology and the pathologist says, yes, it looks like there is um, a high percentage of lymphoblasts in there, that usually indicates stage 5 disease. And we do know that stage 5 disease carries a much poorer prognosis for those dogs. Um, it's harder to get them into complete remission. They're at much increased risk of side effects um, because they may also already have low white cell counts. Um, there is no really good definitive marker on, you know, the, the, the criteria is if it's greater than 30% blasts, um, it's considered stage 5 disease, but um, that really hasn't been tested uh, rigorously. So I think as part of the workup, yeah, I think bone marrow aspirates are very important because it may impact on the owner's decision to even start treatment. They might think, look, okay, things are looking bad, I don't even want to risk it. Um, there is a more intensive treatment that we can use if the owners are, are absolute do-everything owners. Um, but again, if they're owners that just want to, let's just launch into treatment and see what happens, then again, it, it doesn't have to be done before every single, um, or as part of every single staging.
Interestingly, um, what is the use of flow cytometry going to change for us in that regard? Flow is going to be much more sensitive in detecting these cancerous cells in the marrow. Um, and so that's going to put us in a situation that, okay, if we do cytology and we can't see it, but we do flow and we can see it, what do we do then? <laughs> do we use the really high aggressive treatment? Um, or do we say it's all bad? Um, it's just something that we don't know yet. Um, so essentially I'll probably do, do both at the same time. So often you'll see when you send off your CBC that the um, pathologist has said that there were circulating atypical cells. Um, and does that mean that there's bone marrow invasion? Essentially, no. Um, if there was thrombocytopenia and if there were greater than 10% neoplastic lymphocytes on blood smears, it could predict that there was bone marrow involvement, um, but there were lots of false negatives and, and false positives. So it, it's suggestive of bone marrow disease, um, but not definitive. And conversely, you can have a completely normal blood cell count, no atypical cells on a smear, um, and do a marrow sample and come back with blast cells. So. Um, so I think the two need to go hand in hand, but, it, but it's not um, one without the other. So we're, we're in the, the days where we do have access to advanced imaging now, um, perhaps not PET-CT, <laughs> but um, definitely CT. Um, and we're, should we use it or, or not? CT and MR really don't give any more information to us um, compared to chest x-rays and abdominal ultrasound for lymphoma. Perhaps if you've got um, lymphoma in the brain or the spinal cord, yes, but there are no classic um, descriptions of the nodules or the lesions in the brain or the spinal cord that they can say that's lymphoma. You still need cytology or you still need histopathology. Um, there was a study looking at MRI um, you know, to see how well the marrow highlighted with various diseases, um, and they thought there was a different signal intensity, but again, it's, it's, it's really quite subjective. Um, and PET-CT, I don't know whether we'll ever have it in Australia for um, <laughs> vet patients, but, but there are a couple of facilities in um, the UK and America now, and it's obviously widely used in the human world, and for humans with lymphoma, they're having PET-CTs um, quite frequently once they go into remission. It's one of the ways they look at um, that minimal residual disease thing. Have we got the disease coming back at a level that can be detected on imaging, but not clinically? So the, it's useful. Essentially, it works by putting in a um, radioisotope glucose sample, and it's areas that have a higher metabolic um, activity are taking up that, that glucose source and, and glow, basically. So the dog on the left, those roaring red lymph nodes versus the one that's had treatment um, on the right. But again, it would, you know, you know what the cost of a CT is, <laughs> the cost of a PET CT, and to have repeat scans done, I think, um, yeah, I don't think in my lifetime. So prognostic factors are another area that oncologists look out for, again, lots of different diseases. Um, it's a way of us thinking about um, how we should approach the treatment of an individual patient, and it's a way of helping to communicate to an owner what to expect with therapy, um, with or without therapy, I guess. And there have been lots, lots and lots and lots and lots that have been um, reported for lymphoma, and in one study they say this, and then the next study it doesn't hold out. Um, there was, there was one study, I guess, that I thought was quite interesting where they had 127 dogs, which is quite a large number. They were treated with um, multi-agent chemotherapy as standard, and then they plucked out the dogs that had survived for greater than two years. And there was actually a 10% um, ten percent of the patients, which, which is, I guess, a, a, a reasonable number. Um, and what they looked at was... What, were there any characteristics that were um, similar between all those patients that could help us determine which of these patients might have those um, good outcomes? 
Um, so of the 13 long-term survivors, 11 of them were greater than 10 kilograms, were not anemic, they had no hypocalcemia, they had a centroblastic histopath description, they were a B-cell phenotype, they didn't have bone marrow involvement, um, and they hadn't been treated with corticosteroids previously. Um, but unfortunately, the same combination of factors was also in um, 23% of the dogs that survived less than two years. So prognostic factors are useful, um, but at the end of the day, cancer doesn't read a textbook and it does whatever it likes. So this is the exciting part. Um, Multi-agent chemotherapy or CHOP type chemotherapy has been used in humans and dogs for 20, 30 years. Um, again, I think people try and reinvent the wheel. It's the same combination of drugs, but they're just in different orders. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're using vincristine, cyclophosphamide and doxorubicin in some combination, um, then in general, your median time in remission is about, about 12 months, depending on subtypes, obviously. And that's really plateaued. And the same thing happened in the human world. And then um, one of the most exciting things that happened was that they developed these things called monoclonal antibodies. And they are much more specific therapies. So they still use top-type chemotherapy, um, but um, rituximab, which is the, the CD20 monoclonal antibody, has really... Um, really changed the face of lymphoma therapy in humans. You know, they've, they've basically doubled the, the cure rates, which is, which is huge. The rituximab was trialled in um, canine lymph lymphoma, um, but it didn't have the same response. Another form of therapy that has been trialled is radiation therapy. Um, uh, lymphoma cells are exquisitely sensitive to, to radiation, and particularly if you've got perhaps a, um, a solitary disease, so um, you know, solitary T-cell disease or some cutaneous lymphoma lesions that haven't responded to lamustine and you just want to get rid of those, then radiation is great. Um, another way they've been looking at it is using a little bit of chemotherapy, but then what's called um, half-body radiation. So Again, there's various ways it can be done, but essentially they're just giving lower doses and doing half the body at the time. They're trying to avoid all those side effects that you, you traditionally get with radiation. Um, the, the results sound promising, um, but there were still quite a few side effects experienced. Um, and I guess certainly for us in the short term, um, the practicality of, of this may not be available, but, but it's something that, that's still being looked at for the future. Bone marrow transplants or peripheral blood transplants are also being um, used a lot in America, um, but Angela Frimberger at the Animal Referral Hospital is, is still doing um, autologous bone marrow transplants, and she published a, a great paper in 2006 um, so this is the one at the bottom here. There were 28 dogs with high-grade disease. They had a traditional course of multi-agent chemotherapy or CHOP chemotherapy, which they do a Velcap. And the last treatment, they gave a very, very high dose of the cyclophosphamide. And it was chosen because it, um, it doesn't really cause vomiting and diarrhea in a lot of dogs, um, but it can cause really marked bone marrow suppression. So that was then supported um, with a colony stimulating factor, they supported the, the bladder so they didn't get that cystitis. Um, and, and they had some really good outcomes. So the first remission duration for those dogs um, was a median of 378 days. And if you compare that to about the 280 days for, for the general chops, um, that was exciting. And for those dogs that then relapsed and were retreated, some of those had quite prolonged remissions as well. So that's something that she's still um, trying to refine. Um, so if you have any cases um, that you have these owners that perhaps you've had a patient that's failed first-line therapy um, or, or just an owner that's, you know, do everything, then, then um, have a chat to Angela. Otherwise, the, the, the other type of transplants are where 
you um, use a, a machine to sort of um, suck out the blood and pull out some of the um, progenitor cells, then use a high dose of either radiation or, or chemotherapy, and then um, often radiating those cells and, and putting them back in. Um, only very small studies at this stage. The results are not fabulous, um, but I think it's, it's just a, a work in progress. Um, just, just more work needs to be done. Immunotherapy is the holy grail of can, uh, cancer treatment. Um, there are many, many forms of immunotherapy, whether it's a vaccine um, or uh, immune stimulation, etc. The, the monoclonal antibodies are, are definitely being looked at, and um, there's a drug company whose name I can't remember, but um, there are two that have been developed. The first one, AT004, is one against the CD20 monoclonal antibody for canine B-cell lymphoma, uh, and it has got full um, USDA um, licensure now, so it's just a matter of time before it actually comes um, on the market, and, and there is talk it might be by the end of the year. How long it will take to get into Australia, I don't know. There is a conditional license on the um, monoclonal antibody for the T-cell disease. They're still undergoing um, some clinical trials in that. Um, the good thing about monoclonal antibodies is they're used in conjunction with traditional chemotherapy, um, but they're really well tolerated. They're, they don't, they're not cytotoxic chemotherapy, so you don't get vomiting and diarrhea, you don't get myelosuppression. Um, again, I don't know what the costs are going to be, but if they can improve the outcomes in dogs the way they have in humans, then, then, then I think that's fantastic. Um, again, vaccinations are being looked at, and vaccinations can occur in um, all sorts of ways. Um, this one I don't really know anything about, um, but it was just one that I, that I found was still in trial phase. Um, you probably heard of the vaccine that's that's out for canine oral melanoma, so that that's one form of vaccine. Um, I think this is a slightly different format, but but it's something that that may be available in the future. So I guess just to, for today, I didn't really want to come in and say you know if I'm diagnosed this type of lymphoma, then this is the the recipe for that. Um, disease because I, that's just not what lymphoma is. Every patient, every disease, every stage, you know, it, they're all very, very different. And it's knowing which bits of information we need to get to be able to advise the client um, what is the best treatment we should use and what is the prognosis for that patient. Um, so, so those histopath classifications are going to be really important, um, but we don't know specifically what what it all means yet. Um, T versus B is still really, um, really, really important. Um, but again, that's moving down um, to being even more refined. And just to harp on it one more time, um, diagnostic testing is really important as long as we think about why we're doing it and what it means. And, and that no one test is perfect. So I guess if I... Um, just to, to run through, I guess, my general approach to things. If I, if I have a, a very textbook case of lymphoma, it's a six-year-old golden retriever comes in, bright and happy, but just massive you know, golf balls and grapefruits all over. Um, the referring vet has done an FNA and confirmed lymphoma. If, on discussion with the owner, they're happy to, to do the best we can, then I'll be recommending a lymph node biopsy whether that's complete node excision or a wedge or a um, needle core, any of those are fine. Um, and then use immunohistochemistry to try and determine T or B cell. For staging, if the dog is otherwise well, it's middle-aged, um, there's been no history of other problems, then CBC, UA, um, and really just um, bone marrow cytology. I really don't do imaging in, in a lot of these cases now uh, unless there's something that, that is concerning. Um, what I suspect, or well, what I would like to be doing now is um, 
using flow for my bone marrow samples and comparing the cytology and the flow results um, just to get more of a feel for, for what all that means. Um, and then based on that information, I can usually tell the client um, if we have the most common subtype, which is the diffuse large B cell subtype, if we, use, if we don't have bone marrow involvement and we use a CHOP type protocol, then the median time to first recurrence of disease is 17 months. So, so we are getting some of those numbers out. Um, again, you know, should we be treating the T cell disease different to the B cell disease? And that's a, a really good debate as well. Um, T cell disease being the traditionally more aggressive disease, uh, it's thought that if you can use a, a protocol that has more alkylating agents in it, which don't develop cross resistance, then then they may do better. Uh, but again, there's there's been a few studies that have hinted that that might help, um, but nothing really black and white yet. So yes, I do treat them differently. Um, but again, there are a lot of oncologists that still just use chop for everything. Thank you.